I'm James Just, and this is Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is Tyler, Tyler Kuski. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> He's running for supervisor of El Dorado County, and Brandon Nelson, who is the Libertarian Party of California's Northern Area Coordinator. Tyler, let's start with you. You're running for, for yeah, supervisor in, your, in El Dorado County. Why don't yep. you tell us a bit why you're running? Um, I, I, I'm running to, uh, uh, to tackle a lot of issues, but, you know, uh, one thing is to bring jobs back. You know, we lost a lot of jobs uh, through state leg leg uh, legislation. Uh, they got rid of all the, the lumber and the mining jobs. Um, and now everyone who lives in Ella County, no one works in Ella County. So we got to make Ella County great again. I think the first thing that the tackle is going to be the cannabis industry. Um, so right now I'm trying to file. Uh, tomorrow is the deadline to file. Uh, I need to spend close to about $2,000. Rose some money. I don't know if I if I quite haven't rose enough, but you know we'll we'll see. Uh, if anybody's got ex, extra extra money, I can I can use some. Go to toddkuski.com, T Y L E R K U S K I E uh, dot com. And if you donate seventeen dollars and seventy six cents, I will give you a free pocket constitution. You know, just just uh, consider it. <laughs> a little bit of, of we'll see. Get my fingers crossed. I mean, uh, I mean, main thing is the signatures. Actually, I'm really worried about. It. I got I had had a petition for signatures, but you know, we'll see if, if all the paperwork goes through. Yeah, no, I know about that signature thing. I when I would have my little run for office, I had half of my signatures got disqualified, so I missed the ballot by like eighteen signatures. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was it wasn't a pretty sight. Uh, you know, I didn't have time to kind of go and yeah, anyway. pre verify. Yeah, yeah, and verify. Yeah. It's it's it was. It's I an think ugly. I ended up having to turn in around uh, hundred and get sixty for state assembly. Yeah, I I turned in I turned in like seventy and you needed sixty or something like that and then but half of my it, it's a long the process for running for office is actually kind of convoluted right it's not as simple as people think it is yep so, but actually speaking of running for office Camilla Harris has dropped out of the presidential race Ooh, her, I mean, oh, that sucks. <laughs> her supporters are blaming racism and sexism uh, Brandon what do you think about the Camilla Harris dropping out. I'm very happy and excited to have one of the plagues here in California, no longer a contender for president. Um, I, I think that I'm, I'm kind of surprised to see her supporters take that particular angle on it, especially when, if you, if you look at her record, especially as a prosecutor, she really isn't progressive, especially on issues on criminal justice. I mean, you have a person who prosecuted people for drug offenses, for sex work, for... Um, I believe one of the things she wanted to prosecute people for, I'm not sure if she got around to it, was um, the parents of truants. Yes, she prosecuted the parents of children who cut school. Yeah. So I, if you if you actually look at her record, she's not a very progressive candidate at all, in, in my opinion. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised to see her supporters blaming it on other things when ideologically, even for them, she's just not up to par, especially if not with some of the other well, candidates. Well, it's easy to come out to blame, you know, you know can't accept responsibility for yourself, so you know, blame on others, right? It, that seems yeah. to be a, a kind of a, a, a curse in our politics these days, where everybody blames each other. No one looks in the mirror, right? And is this a kind of an example of that she's blaming racism and sexism rather than looking at herself and saying, "Okay, what have I done wrong? What is wrong with my record?" Right? You know, it, it's kind of a, you know, we see that from the now it's so obvious in the Democrat Party, but it's no different in the Republican Party. It, it's, you know. Oh, it, those guys are awful. You did the same thing. Yeah, but it's okay when I do it. it, it, it you know, I but, didn't get caught, though, so there's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't get caught the same way. It's, so, but I, I, I apologized via tweet, so it should be okay. I don't know why you're bringing that up now. Yeah. I deleted the original tweet. <laughs> yeah. right. And these convoluted reasons. It's, you know, she's blaming Her supporters are blaming racism and sexism, but she's a Democrat primary. They're only talking about Democrat voters. So are you, they're calling their own voters sexist and racist. I, think they're, 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 I mean, uh, the Democratic Party has been known to uh, cannibalize itself. So, and, and I read some of the things. Actually, one of the excuses they're saying is that so many Democrats are afraid that Trump is going to win, that they're going to vote for the person they think can beat Trump, which is Biden, even though Biden has no chance of beating Trump. It, it, their thing is all convoluted. Think, I, don't, I think they're emoting again. They're not actually thinking logically. They're not examining anything. They're just feeling and expressing that feeling however it comes out sideways, left yeah. right. So while we talk about things, um, Tyler, you're in the tech, so the government has warned us that your house may be spying on you. While at the same time, admitting James Clapper was at Congress, admitting they're using those those home devices to spy on you. <laughs> From a tech industry perspective, you know, what is the average person supposed to do with this? Um, 
to be honest, there's, there's not too much. I, I'd say the first thing is don't live in fear. Don't don't sit there and uh, and, and cower or be afraid of technology. I have a friend who uh, uh, is very always concerned about you know his phone listening. That when he talks to me, he tries to pull the battery out of his phone and. And sometimes when there's enough alcohol, he doesn't realize that the battery doesn't come out of his phone. And he has to get a new phone the next day. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, there's a few settings you can. There's a lot of times there's settings you can adjust on devices and stuff um, that can disable a lot of these features. Uh, that are really just they're actually really simple. Um, a lot of times it's just as simple as going in, into your settings and disabling a, a certain listening feature. Uh, Facebook, you know, listens into con- your conversations, right? We all we all know that you'll you talk about something, and then all of a sudden you see an ad for it the next day. Yep. Uh, I mean, you can literally go into the settings and you can disable that that feature. Uh, and then actually, you can you can do that not just manually through the app, but you can actually uh, install. They have there are apps like on, on the market, and this is more particularly just with phones, but there are apps on the market that you can install that will uh, disable those features on other apps without the app, the app having control of it. Um, so you, there's additional uh, proof points you can do that. Uh, as far as like tech devices, you know, um, a, lot of the, a lot of those things are listening. Um, you know, as far as keeping those secure, I mean, you can keep them in airplane mode or make sure they're not connected to, to the net. Um, <clears throat> you know, I can't really say too much. I, I, I've worked on uh, on projects through my company, my employer, um, so, so I can't really give you in, get into detail about yeah. how a lot of that stuff works. But you know. Uh, another thing is using generic drivers. Uh, if you use OEM drivers or, or on a device or the drive, the, the manufacturer's drivers, uh, a lot of times those drivers are, are what are through the NSA or whatever. But um, if you use a generic driver, a lot of times it's a little bit more secure. You're going to have hardware problems. but Oh, so you're saying there's actually a benefit for me to go into the hacker communities and getting the drivers they might use because they've cleaned them. You know, theoretically, they may have cleaned them. You know, you also can get one who's put something else in there. You know, there's always... I mean, theoretically, <laughs> but I mean, even within the hacker communities, I mean, a lot of, the, a lot of times those things get bugged too. I mean, yeah, well, the hackers want to bug them themselves. You know, you've got the white hat hackers. It's a, con- it's a constant battle. Uh, I mean, as far as, you know, uh, and, and I know a lot of folks through, uh, who've worked in the, in, in, through the NSA and everything just through my employer, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of data collection. They, they, they don't have a very easy time looking at your data. So when you say something, you can, you can make a lot of threats to your phone. Uh, the NSA is not going to be at your door the next day because they have millions of those threats going on all the time here throughout the world. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't think it should be a, a fear that you're, you know, they're going to hear everything, but it is unconstitutional for them to be listening. Well, I think it's, it's one of those things where you, it's actually the easiest place to hide is out in the open. So if you're just having a random conversation like everybody else, you actually become invisible, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't stick out. Is there's a you know, if, especially if you have a, a history of subtlety, being unsubtle is actually the easiest way to hide. It's a very strange kind of thing. But as we talk about you're talking about privacy, um, California has claims to protect your privacy, right? While well, the DMV is selling it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Brandon, you're the kind of they're the party official. Um, so maybe you can cover this for us, but what kind of insanity is that? I don't even know how to describe this. I'm, I'm honestly not sure what kind of policies might be in place that would prohibit them from doing it. Granted, that's assuming that there are policies in place to prohibit them from doing something that's making them money. Um, but it's, it's definitely concerning because especially when, um, you know, particularly from the government's perspective, although you do have particularly uh, anarchists and some minarchists claiming that you shouldn't, either you don't have to get a driver's license in order to operate a vehicle or you shouldn't have to, um, the state requires you to go into the DMV to get a license and requires you to surrender certain information to them, which I, I think that most, if not all of us, would surrender in good faith in order to get the license. We don't really think anything of it. Um, so it's, it's extremely disappointing and concerning to hear that they're turning around and selling that information that's given to them. I mean, like, it's, I, I, I don't think, like, with, with certain tech companies or apps, you know, you, you might hit submit on an end user agreement or something. And that gives them certain permissions where if you don't read the fine text, it, it gives them a lot of ambiguity to collect information, sell it to advertisers, whatever. Um, at least that is is more clear cut. I mean, you, you hit the button to agree to the terms of the contract, whereas with the Department of Motor Vehicles, I'm trying to get permission from the state to drive on a road that my tax dollars paid to build and a car that I own and I'm paying taxes to you on that as well. 
I, I don't really think that it's entering into most people's minds that that alone is a is a risk for our privacy that they're turning around and then selling that to to companies whatever data that they collect or information about your driving record it's not something that it, it, it's not even necessarily that it's something that you would have to worry about if an employer were to run a background check it's now something that anyone who pays the right amount of money can just have access to and that, that, that's also true of your uh, voter registration when you register to vote um, you can buy people's uh, voter registration so I mean yeah. The government's always selling data, uh, and they're I mean they're collecting already. I wouldn't be surprised if the NSA opens up shop. You know. Yeah, well, it's actually kind of worse than that. It's not just driver's license. You go in for an ID, you're going to get your data. And and when you talk about public companies, you know, one of the things I freely give my data to Facebook and, and whatever, so I can use their services for nothing. I'd rather give them my data, which is to me is actually worthless, but to um, some, to give it to some marketer who's going to try to sell me tires that I've already bought, you know, which is essentially what happens. And you know, so I don't have to pay. It's it's my eyeballs are my are my currency, right? That's and so I actually agree to that. I don't. I'm actually paying DMV to give them my information for them to give me my ID, <laughs> so them to, to turn, turn around, around and, and sell, sell my information. Yeah. It's, so there's a there's a trend. Yeah, like I should get a free driver's license then. Yeah, right? there's a trend. There's <laughs> exactly. A tra Can I get a rebate on my car or on my car registration? Yeah, it, exactly. it seems to me like there's. I'm paying for them to right? sell my. Car. Oh yeah, no, I, my car <laughs> Wait registration a here here is outrageous. I mean, compared to other states, California, right. like like, I think I have to pay uh, almost four hundred bucks every year on my registration. Oh yeah. Well, and then I believe um, I want to say it's all pickup trucks are automatically um, registered as commercial vehicles. <laughs> So you're, if you own a pickup, you're automatically being charged way more on your registration than someone who owns like a, a Prius or someone who's commuting. Yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Well, because they know since that they're you can, automatically you can charge your, your friends and family to go move. Uh, you know, help them move or something like that. So, <laughs> well, I don't think they're they, assuming you're just in business automatically. Right? I don't think they care that much. I think they know that a lot of these trucks are bought by fleet vehicles, and that's where they're going to get the most money. And if an <laughs> individual who wants to buy a truck is just going to have to stuff it. It's, they don't, well, that's essentially how it's working. But I, I think that that at least would be some small modicum of comfort. <laughs> if, hey, you're, if you're going to turn around and sell all of my information, then can I at least get like a hundred dollars off on that? On the registration yeah, fee, Can I get a please? real rebate here? I, yeah. yeah, I honestly think that someone should try this, and I'll have to talk to my, my attorney friends and see if this is possible. We should just send the DMV a bill for all my information that they sold. If I can somehow <laughs> prove that they sold it and see how much they got for it, send them a bill uh, off of my, my next driver's license or my, my, my your registration. registration. <laughs> well, that actually brings up a quick point about you know the value of your data is your individual data is essentially worthless. Right, it's not until that data is all collected and aggregated, and and a marketer can yeah. sit there and make your individual data. No one's going to pay me twenty cents for my individual search data. Exactly. Right? No one cares. It's it's that when that data is gathered together in kind of this mass thing, and you can make and mass marketers can make decisions about where to put their money and where to. So your individual data isn't really worth anything. It's this mass collection of essentially sanitized data that yeah. actually has value. No, that makes sense. So let's not. When we talk about these companies using data, you've got people trying to sell you stuff with using mass data, and lots of times they're awful. They're trying to sell you tires after you bought some, you know, or it, your hard drive after you bought one. You know, it's goofy. Or like when I upgraded my computer, I bought a new processor. Did they try to sell me a fan or a hard drive? No, they tried to sell me more processors. And no, sorry, it was your competitor. Um, oh, <laughs> you know what? I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking about leaving. San Francisco's <laughs> poop problem is getting worse. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't visit San Francisco because of that problem. <laughs> I mean, so, but it's, there's someone who's running for... Out of all the reasons for, you have to not visit San Francisco? There's, there's a lot of reasons. But, yeah, well, <laughs> as, a super, as someone who's running for supervisor, how are you going to keep this problem from getting up into El Dorado County? As these problem problems well, first of all, we do have a problem, but it's more of forces rather than homeless people. <laughs> Um, no, but uh, there is an increasing uh, amount of ho homeless population because obviously that's usually uh, circling around homeless. Um, and, and I know that ever since we, uh, we we opened up the Red Hawk Casino up up in Ella County, which don't get me wrong, I, I don't mind having a casino, uh, you know, nearby. The problem is it did bring bring more homeless. Um, and, and so right now, what the county is actually doing is uh, police officers uh, are doing, um, or not police officers, sheriff's department. Uh, are, are doing um, you know safety checks on, on the homeless people. They're not necessarily arresting them, which is a good thing. So they're they're not uh, incriminating them. They're they're just basically doing a check up, make sure they have blankets, make sure they have food, 
so the, I, I think right now the sheriff's department is actually doing a really good job with, with the policing uh, on making sure that the, the homeless are taken care of. They're not treating them like criminals. Uh, you know, I had to look more into how that behavior is. I mean, I, I still feel that there might be some so that might need to be approved on, but I, I think continuing on, on that type of methodology is addressing homeless people. Don't treat them like, like criminals. Uh, that's the first step. Uh, but the next step is, is somehow moving them from, from away from homelessness. Uh, now, being homeless can also be a choice, so obviously we, we can't force someone to not be homeless. But, uh, you know, anybody who does not want to be in, in, in homeless, we need to somehow make it easy for them to get out of that life. So we don't necessarily have to do it for them. We don't have to... Uh, give them money, we don't have to give them a job, but we, we, we definitely need to make sure that uh, what, whatever they, they obstacles that are stopping them from, from becoming not homeless is out of the way. Like removing barriers such as, um, you know, you can only have uh, what, what uh, one tenant in your, in your home, in your, your personal home or something like that. You know, those type of silly laws. I mean, if you can have more tenants in your, in your home and you can yeah. rent, rent out lower rates, that lower, lower the rates for people to live, um, you know, make, you know, don't let the uh, gig economy go, go away. That helps, that stops homelessness. People have, have an easy way to make money. I knew someone who uh, had a drug problem, uh, couldn't really hold a job, but you know, because uh, of the gig economy, he was able to make money to, you know, put food on the table and, you know, have a place to stay. Um, you know, granted with other forms of help and stuff, and eventually he got rehab and he's all better now. But you know, the, the, you like know. the gig economy actually helped him bridge that gap, right? Yeah. Make the gap from, from, okay, I've got this problem, that I don't can't a traditional job won't work for me until I while I build myself up to I get to the point where I can re-enter whatever the normal society yeah. however you they'll, want they'll to do what San Francisco is doing where they're, where they're making an app called Poop Maps and you can like track down where all, where all that I mean like that's not fixing the problem that's just like oh let's just avoid the problem no we've got <laughs> and we've got two we've got short term solutions and then we have long term solutions right short term solutions is some shelter and getting these and getting people their services they need but the long term solutions is about rebuilding our family safety nets our so and our and our, and our not this we talk about social safety nets so many type people talk about government programs but what about a social safety net as your family your friends your family you know how do we as politicians support your fam friends and family from helping people <laughs> you're running for office man you're a politician <laughs> you know it's a derogatory term i did it too <laughs> right i did it too it's my you know my own thing but how do we get there how do we how do we get to this place where we're rebuilding family safety nets and friends safety nets and these community safety nets where it's getting away from government programs and getting back to the humanity well i think that a lot of it needs to happen um Decentralization would help, um, getting cutting through some of the regulations, leaving more opportunities at the local level, whether, you know, in cities you probably need to look at it at more at the neighborhood level. Um, like I, I believe that one of the articles that we read had um, had a, oh, actually probably this one, it had a, a quote from a supervisor overseeing the Tenderloin District in San Francisco. His needs to handle the homelessness issue are probably much more specific than issues in another area. So allowing allowing more localized control to deal with the issue as it crops up would be beneficial. But I also think that we need to try and cut through some of the nimbyism and reduce the overall cost of living by actually allowing, like, cutting down on the zoning. That way we can actually build more housing, whether it's, I mean, like, not just affordability, because you have... You have like the Section 8 housing that comes in, there are significant issues with the Section 8, but even just building regular housing, I mean, yeah, it might be expensive, but you're allowing people that are currently working in one area and living in another to move closer to their work, you're, you're lowering the, the cost of housing in the surrounding communities. I mean, these people will have more options on where they can live and based on the, based on the availability of housing, the cost of living. I was reading an article the other day, and I'll try and post, post it on, remember to post it on the website when I get a chance, that um, we are, oh, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> I hate when that happens, um, oh, I forgot my train of thought, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I get for trying to make a qualification, so let's just move on, we'll go ahead and move on, we'll let me go ahead and move on. So people are fleeing California, or it's actually kind of brazen, people are fleeing California, uh, is we getting too expensive, and why are we getting too expensive? Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of the, uh, how the housing market uh, has a big influence on it. Um, average price in California, uh, California for a home. Um, I was reading an article though; they floated uh, over, I think it was like one point two million. I mean, living in the Bay Area, which is where a large, where a lot of wealth comes from, 
Um, buying a home for a million dollars will get you to ghetto. Uh, if you make less than $120,000 in San Francisco, you qualify for Section 8 housing. So there's this huge inflation of, of the money um, and just pushing the currency up. Uh, and, and a lot of it, um, it is this whole centralization you know, that, that California is always trying to do. Not to mention the amount of taxes they're always trying to bring, bring in. Yep. Um, <clears throat> all well, this... that and then killing off your economic prospects with stuff like AB5 that killed the gig economy. Yeah, killing off. Like, yeah, if you're gonna kill jobs, like what, what's there's no you can't do that in, in California. You're, you're making poor Come people on. poor, and you're cutting down the prospects. Everyone's forever. wanting to leave. I mean, I mean, I, I don't. I, I want to stay here and, and fight the fight, but you know, it, it is really tempting to go to, to as simple as going to Nevada, like which is right next door. Uh, you, I can buy a home in Nevada, like a three bedroom home, for less than two hundred thousand dollars, and a relatively new home, not not some old home, but I can get a, a relatively new home, three bedroom house for. Less than 120, whereas California, you're talking uh, at least in my area, uh, a little bit cheaper, but, you know, about 500,000. No, I I live at the in the edge of a ghetto, and a little postage stamp house, and the, there's a little postage stamp house down the street from me, went for 500,000 dollars, 498 thousand dollars. We're at the edge of the ghetto. We're in Oak Park. This is insane, right? And, and like you're saying, I can theoretically, you know, my house is my grandfather's house. He built it, so we could theoretically sell it for cash and, and move to Nevada and have money in the bank. Yeah, and then my parents have even talked about that. that I know that they were discussing and selling their home uh, and they were going to use the money to, and I don't know if they're following through on this plan but they said they were going to sell their home, use the money to buy two homes in Oregon or not Oregon, um, Idaho and then rent one of those homes out and just live in the other one and that way they have a residual income from the renters in the other home. Yeah, it's we've created and but does that kind of destroy these family safety nets that we're talking about? Is you build a home for you know it used to be that you bought a house not to as a an investment, a monetary investment, you bought it so you could pass it off to your grandchildren and your great grandchildren, and so your future generations had something to, to build their lives from. And now we've kind of turned our houses into a crass monetary investment. Yeah, and, and you know there, there's a lot of I think there's, that's a really huge. Um, you know, system to look at. Uh, a lot of it is the Cobra effect. Um, if you guys are familiar with the Cobra effect, is uh, uh, way back in, in England, uh, w or way back in India when England ruled India, uh, they they wanted to get rid of cobras or ban cobras, so they basically offered a bounty. If you turn in dead cobras, you'd get money. Uh, and then what ended up happening is people started breeding cobras to turn in dead cobras, and so they caught on to that. And they're like, oh, well, we can't get offer money because we weren't breed cobras, and then so. When they stopped offering money, they, all the cobra farms, let all the cobras go, so now they had more cobras. So in California, same thing, the cobra effect is happening, is where they try to tackle these housing issues, they create these regulations, they, they create these uh, price ceilings, uh, and when they realize that they don't work and they back up on these things, and you end up making the problem worse than it was before. Uh, and a lot of it is the government just needs needs to step back a little bit. Uh, and, and I don't think, it's, I'm not gonna say like, like the government needs to step away from everything and just like let, let, let it go to, uh, you know, complete chaos, but you know, def definitely need, need to cut back on the amount of restrictions and, and their involvement uh, and, and, and address simple issues that aren't, they don't risk a huge cobra effect. You know, you don't want to uh, create a, pr uh, a price ceiling that, that, that may un unintentionally have an effect, uh, a ripple effect, you know, years down the, down the line and stuff. You know, there's, there's a lot of factors that are, that are at play. So, I mean, this, I feel this is a pr really complex issue. We can't really discuss all the possibilities and reasons why this happened on the show, but you know, yeah, it's it's a you could sit here we could have a three hour discussion and still not actually get the whole thing. It, but it's you know how do we move forward is often the question. But let's we want we got a few minutes left. We'll move on to a quick uh, topic. There was an essay in the Sacramento News and Review about Sacramento not being as livable as Portland. <laughs> I'm pointing one thankful for that because the guy wants is he wants these protected bike lanes and two lane roads and everything for pedestrians. As someone who earns a living by driving, I think well that's going to be awful, right? What about how do we, you know, with livability used to mean balance. You balance the needs of pedestrians and bicyclists versus the needs of drivers and commuters. We seem to have lost that. Yeah, yeah and, and I know that what Portland is relatively the same size as, as Sacramento in, in population. Um, I think Portland might be slightly slightly bigger, but you know, I, uh, at least I, I'm almost surprised that, that Sacramento uh, fell between the cracks and Portland ca caught up. And I always thought that Portland would be a horrible city, but somehow Portland became a good city and Sacramento was falling. Um, and we, we, you know, we're expand. We have we have this huge problem with, with the ghetto, and it's constantly expanding and stuff. Um, 
I mean, maybe we need to look at what's going on in Portland. I don't necessarily think that everything going on in Portland is necessarily a good thing. They do have a lot of unbearable taxes, and, and Portland may risk uh, becoming the next Sacramento. I mean, there, there, there's there's a few things that, are, that you're going to look at that, but, you know. Well, I think there's a, there's a, there's a there seems to be a worldview that's yeah. imposed by these urban planners. I mean, we've got another about urban planners living in a fantasy land disaster we won't get to, but these urban planners seem to have this worldview they want imposed, and whether, well, if you're outside of that, you, you just kind of stuff In my it. opinion, they're making idealistic projections on the changes that they would like to see, and if that doesn't occur, then they're trying to hope to shove everyone into that box to, to meet that worldview and to fit within the community versus actually trying to create a community that's tailored to the individuals that live there. I mean, it, it's great if you can reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions by cutting down on on driving, but if you're trying to force people into inefficient public transit when people don't want to use it, you're you're just going to cause more traffic. Yeah, you're just using economic pain to yeah, try and force I, people to, to behave some way that they don't which, want to behave. I don't think they're these issues are necessarily do. directed to the cities. I, th I think they're more state problems. I mean, look at Oregon as a state, uh, I think, has a lot, far less regulations than California as a state. And that, that's probably why Portland is doing so much better than, than Sacramento, uh, just because the state isn't, isn't bearing down over the city. I mean, cities can only do so much to harm themselves. I mean, the state uh, it, it is really what's going to cause, cause the most disaster. Like, look what's happening in my county um, with, with California, you know, passing all, getting rid of, banning all of our jobs. Yeah, it's just, I think as Oregon is, the state, Oregon, state Oregon is starting to follow California's lead. So maybe this thing about, Portland being livable is a short-term gain. Maybe, maybe they are going to catch up, because uh, you know, my understanding is that Oregon is having becoming more and more like California, uh, the politics wise. Yeah, and so, that's true. Oh. and so you know, whether that how that plays out in the long term is an uh, opening question. And as we close out the show, Tyler, do you have a we have twenty seconds for you to finish out. You know, you got anything for your campaign? Um, it, 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 Look for Kyle Kuski in the ballot, and if you donate seventeen dollars and seventy six cents, I'll send you a constitution. Yeah, that's good for that. So, KyleKuski.com. As we're about out of time, I'd like to thank our guests Tyler and Brandon for showing up. If you want information about Tyler's campaign, you can go to his website TylerKuski.com. For information on the topics we discuss, you can please visit our website LibertarianCounterpoint.com. I'll try to get all these updated. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the like, subscribe. And if you like the notification buttons, you can start looking for us on all your favorite social media platforms. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching. And please remember, love everybody.